My name is Alden MacDonald. I'm the executive chef at Northern Michigan University, and today we're gonna make pupusas con cortito. And what that is, is pupusas are like little fried cakes, and then cortito is a slaw, that is a vinegar-based slaw. And we're very familiar up here in the Upper Peninsula with slaws, but we're not so much familiar with the little cakes, but once you see it, you're gonna go, oh, that's like, it's kind of like a cross between an empanada and, because it's fried, but it's got cheese in the middle, kind of like, um, I would say, I don't know, like a pierogi, but without the mashed potatoes. Like it's kind of a mix. And they're delicious and you eat it with the, with the slaw, so you get like the cold and crunchy with the warm and gooey with the cheese, it's really good. So the first thing we need to do is we need to make the base for our pupusas. So I have a mixing bowl here I have masa harana, harina, sorry, and masa flour is very, we are mostly familiar because of tamales. Up here a lot of people make tamales, it's pretty familiar, but we're going to use it a little different way and we're going to just add this here. This is about two cups. I've got salt, a good pinch of salt in there, and then water. I'm going to add this water here. It's going to be about a cup and a half of water. You're going to mix it in. Your hands are going to get a little messy, but that's okay. You can also use gloves if you want. I think the recipe says to use a fork, but I use my hands. Because you want this to really mix well, and you want it to feel like Play-Doh. And also, this will continue to soak up that water, so you want to be pretty liberal with the amount of water it's in here. If it gets really wet, just add a little more masa. If it's a little dry, add a little more water. And we're almost there. As you can see, it's a little crumbly right here. We don't want that. We want it to all be nice and squishy like that. So we're going to knead it in, almost like a bread dough. Most masa is also gluten-free, so this is great for our gluten-free folks. This whole recipe is gluten-friendly, which is good for lots of reasons. Oh, we're almost there. As you can see, as it starts to hydrate, it pulls together and the sides, you know, that cleans up those sides. And see, I just kind of did that and it all kinds of sticks to it. I'd say this needs just a teeny bit more water. And the reason I know that is because when I pull it up and I pull it apart, see how it crumbles a little when I pull it apart? That means it's not quite wet enough. So I'm gonna add just a smidge more water and mix that in. And if it seems a little wet now, that's okay because we're actually gonna set this aside and let it sit for about 10 minutes. And as it sits for about 10 minutes, it will continue to soak up that water and rehydrate. So if it seems just a teensy bit wet, that's a good thing. So now, when I take it, see how no pieces fall off? That means, and see it's nice and squishy like Play-Doh. That's what we want. So we're gonna set this aside. There we go. I'm just making a nice little ball. We're gonna set this aside and then we're gonna start on the slaw. But first, I'm gonna make a pause and I'm gonna wash my hands. Okay, now that I've washed my hands, I grabbed another mixing bowl here and we're going to make the curtido. So I had a leftover Napa cabbage in my refrigerator that I needed to use about half of it. So here it is. I've already cleaned it um, so we don't have to worry about that part. But when you're doing Napa cabbage, like any other cabbage, you're gonna peel a few of the leaves off of the outside. Make sure you get to the center where it's nice and firm. Make sure it's clean. If you need to rinse it off, you can. All my veggies are cleaned already. So we're just gonna jump right into it. So the first thing I'm gonna do with this is I've got half a cabbage here. I'm just gonna cut this in half. And the reason why is because I wanna shred the cabbage. So this here, this core, we don't want that in our shredded cabbage that will not shred well. So I'm gonna cut that out on a diagonal. I'm going to do the same thing for here. Just cut that a diagonal, and now the core is out. So, a nice sharp knife is important to get a good, a good shred. So I'm going to curl my hands, forefinger, thumb, pinch my blade, wrap my fingers around. That's called a pinch grip. It's very important. And then the fingers here go here, and I'm just going to slice really thin. Because this is kind of high up, I can't really keep the tip of my knife on the board like the proper way to do it, so instead I just go through. 
If your knife is nice and sharp, it should do most of the work. A lot of times I tell the people I'm training that your knife should do the work. You're, all, you're just there to guide it. If you're having to really push your knife through, that means that your knife is too dull and you need to get it sharpened. So when it gets to this point here, it can get kind of wobbly. So what I do is I actually turn it face down right here so that we don't, we don't want wobbly vegetables. Wobbly vegetables equal um, cut fingers. So at the end here, it's not big anymore. I can just speed up, cut through here. Beautiful. And then we're gonna do the same thing here. Nice and thin. I really like Napa cabbage. It's a little different than your traditional cabbage. Napa cabbage also sautés really well. Now that we're at the end here, this is getting a little wobbly, so I'm just rotating. There we go. All done. So I'm going to take this, put it right in my bowl here. Sometimes when I'm doing this at home, I'll just take my board right off the end of the table. It works great. Okay. So I've made my life a little bit easier and I've already shredded my carrots. I used a food processor to shred my carrots, but you don't have to do that. You can use a box grater. But what if you don't have a box grater at your house? What if you don't have a fancy food processor? That's okay. You don't necessarily have to grate your carrots. As long as they're cut really thin, the vinegar and spices that we put on this will do the same thing to the carrots as if they were shredded or if they were grated. So if you don't have a box grater or a food processor at home to shred these, then just take them and cut super, super thin slices. You could do little rounds. You could cut it in half and do little half moons. Those are fine too. Just cut them really, really thin thin like you did your cabbage and since we want this to sit overnight and marinate in the vinegar it'll break down and flavor your vegetable the same so I'm going to just dump that in there it was a very big carrot that was one carrot and then my onions the same thing I just want I love I love a nice pickled onion in here and that's what we're doing vinegar based slaw, slaw is basically we're just making pickles so I've got this onion here um, because I want thin stri strips I'm going to cut the end off because I want to get rid of that core. And then I'm just going to, again, notice my knuckles. I always have a guide so I know where my, where my knife is all the time. My finger knows it, and it's never coming in contact with the actual sharp part of the blade. And I'm just slicing that really, really, really thin. Notice it's super thin. That's what we want. Now, a lot of times, we get to about right here, and our flat edge is really, really tiny. Just push it over. Then you have a nice big flat edge again. And because it's slower, you don't have to pick your knife up to cut anymore like that. So we're just doing nice thin slices. Watch those fingers at the end. If you have to, let it fall again. That's okay. There we go. Again, I'm just going to whoop right into my bowl. Sound effects are always great. So I've got this here. And then I'm just going to make a really easy slaw dressing. This is apple cider vinegar with a little water. I've got a little brown sugar. Oh, it's being stubborn. There we go. I got a little brown sugar there. I've got some red pepper flakes, just a pinch. I've got some oregano. That will rehydrate um, really, really well. And then I'm gonna just going to take salt because we want to flavor our food. Salt is a flavor enhancer. Pepper is a flavor additive, so be aware of that. If you don't want the pepper flavor, it's, don't add it. Then I'm just going to swirl this around. Doo -doo -doo. Not very difficult. And then I just pour this over this. Whee! Then I take my tongs, and I'm just going to toss it together. This is best if you do it the, a day ahead, but you got to let it sit for at least a couple hours because that vinegar and salt will actually start to draw some of the moisture out of your vegetables. It will start to force some of those flavors into your vegetables, just like a pickle. And then you get uh, that nice, crunchy, sweet, sour, saltiness that you like for a slaw. Am I making a mess? Okay, good. So it's mixed together. I actually have some that I made last night. And all I have to do is mix it up. And one thing I'll show you is you can see the juices there. 
Those are all juices that have come out overnight. And that's why we want to mix this up really well because we want those juices incorporated into the slaw. That tastes amazing. And that is your dressing for the coleslaw. Okay, so we stick this over here and that's our curtido. And that just hangs out now until we're done with our pupusas. So that's the next thing we're gonna do. We've let them sit for 10 minutes, the dough. So we've got our dough here. It's like Play-Doh. Looks like it could use just a teeny bit more moisture. That can happen, because remember, this will continue to hydrate as it sits. So if it needs a little more moisture, that's fine. I always keep it just a little bit of extra water around when I do this. Okay. And I'm just gonna incorporate till I get the Play-Doh consistency I'm looking for. A little bit more. And then we're gonna make our little cakes that we're gonna fry. We want our oil to be nice and hot and our oil, I'm gonna set this aside second so I can show you. It's a little bit more than if you're frying for vegetables. As you can see, it pools in the pan. And the reason that matters is you want a nice layer of oil in the bottom of that pan. And if you have it, you want a nice flat pan. That's very important. So we're gonna heat that up while we're making our little cakes. Okay, so we've got, we've got our dough. Let's set this over here so you can see. So what I do is just split it in half, split it in half again, and split it in half again. And if you do that, you end up with eight balls that are almost exactly the same size. Ta-da! And then you take your cheese. Okay, so what's best to use is like a cotija cheese or like a queso fresco. I actually am using um, a cheese called Baccio cheese, which is a buffalo and whole milk mozzarella. And the reason why is because I'm much more likely to find a cheese like this than I am gonna find like a queso fresco or a, a cotija cheese. And so, and also if you, a lot of times people have mozzarella sitting in their fridge and you're like, well, I made pizza or whatever with it and I've got this like half a cup of mozzarella cheese left, what am I gonna do with it? Use it in this, it's delicious. So we're gonna just make a ball, then we're gonna take that ball and we're going to make a bowl. We make a ball, then we make a bowl. We're gonna create a pocket, boop. Then you take some of this cheese. I'm a cheese lover, so I really stuff it in there. And then you bring the edges of your bowl forward because we know it's Play-Doh and you cover that cheese up so it's in the center of your ball like that. So you got a ball, you got the cheese in there. And then what I do is I just take my hands and I lightly squeeze it like this. Looks like I need even a little bit more moisture, but that's okay. We'll do that with the next one. And I just squish it out into a disc that's about a quarter inch. And there you go, a nice little disc. Then you have a cheese filled disc of doughy goodness. All right, so then through the magic of TV, so I've gone ahead and formed our eight balls here. We're gonna move these over and I will form those later. So we have our balls, our little uh, pupusa here. We're gonna see if our, oh, looks like our oil is almost hot. Okay, a little, a little trick, okay? I, I did not learn this in culinary school. I learned, I learned this from some grandma or mom or aunt or something. When you know your oil is ready to do frying, you actually take a wooden spoon, if you have it in a house, and you put your wooden spoon in there. And if bubbles immediately start to come off the wooden spoon in your oil, it's ready to fry. Not everybody has a thermometer or something like that at their house. They're gonna be able to like see, ooh, is it 350 degrees for deep frying? Well, who has that? Well, I do, but most people don't. So the reason why I say this is take a spoon. I still do it today. The wooden spoon, I cook only with wooden spoons at home. I put it in there and if the bubbles come off, I know it's ready for frying. You can do it in here too because you have just enough. I don't know your wooden spoons on me, but you can do it. So if you don't have a wooden spoon, just kind of place it in there. It's not immediately frying, so it's not ready. So we're going to give that another minute and we're going to turn our heat up. Oh, wrong way. Oh, 
almost. Don't use the same side when you check your oil because it already has oil on it. It will not give you the proper litmus test. <laughs> Another thing too is when you're looking at oil in a pan, when you first put it in there, it looks kind, it looks kind of gluggy, right? It goes in there, it holds its shape a little bit in that cold pan. When it's hot, it will be shimmery. It will shimmer the surface of the oil and it will be really, really loose. And that's because it's heated up and the shimmering is ind indicative of that energy that's being transferred from the heat into the oil. And that's important. Oh, we're almost there, almost there. So that's one thing to look at as well, is if it doesn't look shimmery, it's not ready. I used to call that smiling, the oil is smiling. I have no idea where I picked that up. Ah, okay, we're ready. So when your oil is nice and hot, another thing, to that'll tell you that your oil is getting hot is you'll actually be able to start to smell it. So that's something to be aware of. If you're like, it smells like a deep fryer. <laughs> it's because the oil is hot. So be aware of that. So when you set these in, whenever you set something in a hot oil, especially if there's a lot of oil, like your pan frying like this, whenever you do that, you want to place them so that they flip away from you. Don't ever have them flip towards you. That's a great way to get a burn. I bet I, there we go. You want enough room in your pan so that the oil comes up around the sides of that dumpling, that little cake. And you don't want to crowd it. If you put too many, if I try to stick one more in here, there'd be too many. The moisture escaping from my cakes would actually steam the different, the cakes in here and not fry them. And that's a problem. Also, all the bubbles that you see when you're frying, it's steam. So be aware of that. If you have your hand over this, there's hot steam escaping. So be safe whenever you're frying something. So we're just going to fry these until they're golden brown and then we're going to flip them. And when I flip them, I can use this or I can use tongs. I'm going to steal my tongs from here. No, I have tongs. I'll be right back. So whichever way you decide to flip these, just make sure you're being safe. So, because you don't want to pop hot oil on yourself. Oop. I'm just looking, ooh, they look good. Okay, they're almost there. I'll give them another 10 seconds or so. And notice that once they start frying, they hold together very well. And that's important too. If they're too dry, they kind of flake off. And if they're too wet, they might stick in the bottom of your pan. Beautiful. So I'm going to flip these over and when I flip them again, I want to make sure I'm flipping away from myself. There we go. And these fry up really quickly. It's just a minute or two on each side and they're done. While these are frying, I'm going to step off and grab a little paper towel to dab the oil on. I've got some paper towel. Uh, when I'm at home, I have a cooling rack that I use for like muffins and that kind of stuff. And a lot of times I'll take paper towel or a towel, put it underneath my cooling rack. And then I'll put that cooling rack and then I'll put them on there. In a restaurant, you know, we have baskets. We fry things, we have a basket or something. Well, we don't have that at home, right? So that's the way that I kind of emulate the idea of being able to drain a little off out of a basket or something from a fryer at home without a fryer basket. All right, let's take a look. Looks like they're almost done. Inevitably, you always have one side of your pan that's a little hotter than the other. Even though I put this in almost last, it's the one that's almost done. So we're gonna take this one off first. Woo. If that happens, just step away. Ooh, you can see the cheese. <laughs> so this one's done. The it popped a little as I brought it out, but that's okay. Here we go. It's proof that there's cheese in there, I guess. Great, this one's done. And these smell really good. They smell that very indicative like corn smell that you smell with tamales. I'll see in another minute. Okay, so these come out. They're beautiful. There we go. And you would just serve these like this with a little bit of your 
cortito on the side like this. Great, I'm gonna pull these off. Beautiful, okay. So you do these and then I just wanna show you here, if we do this, see that cheese pole? Look at that cheese pole, oh yeah. And that's paired with this nice fresh slaw it's going to be some really great meal that you could do with your kids. They'd love that. Delicious. So here is your pupusas con cortito. Enjoy. <laughs>